Hi there, welcome everybody, and thank you for joining us joining us today for this APMG webinar. My name is Mark Constable. I'll be your host and moderator for the session. It's a pleasure to be joined as ever by um, our fantastic guest presenter, Melanie Franklin. Um, Melanie is going to be talking to us today about agile culture because we, uh, I think, many of us will be familiar with the the, the, the concept or the idea that culture is obviously is often one of the main blockers to the adoption of agile practices or the adoption of an agile culture. So. Uh, Melody is going to be looking at some of the uh, some of the causes of that and what we can do to address some of the challenges in the area of culture when it comes to agile practices. Um, just before I hand over, uh, well, actually, let me just put, uh, give a quick uh, introduction to Melanie for those that aren't familiar. I think there will be some people on the call that have been on previous webinars, so we'll know, but I'll do that quickly for the benefit of those that haven't. So Melanie's a, a trainer. Uh, consultant, practitioner in areas such as Agile, project and program management and change management, a real expert in the field um, and she'll be bringing a lot of that experience to this session today. So just before I hand things over to Mel, I'll just cover a few bits of housekeeping. So the first point to note is the session is being recorded and everyone that's registered will receive a follow-up email once the recording is available online, so do look out for that. Uh, you're welcome to submit questions at any stage throughout the presentation. I'll be keeping a close eye on those as, as we go and we'll try and address as many as, as we can towards the end. And last but not least, your feedback is very welcome. So that helps us with planning and delivering webinars in the future. So any feedback, positive or negative, is gratefully received. Uh, so that's about it for me, I think. So without further ado, Mel, it's all yours. Thank you. Right. I know it's the end of a long day for many of us and a long week, perhaps, or it's the lunchtime on a Thursday if you're in the US or Canada and you're just trying to chunt through your sandwich before you start the afternoon. Um, but I'll be um, focused and I will deliver and we won't go past the hour. That's my plan. Um, we're going to look at why agile culture is important. Mark's just made a very uh, relevant comment about if you look at the state of agile, the 15th state of agile um, research piece that's gone out, um, if you look at the J-curve piece on um, uh, agile culture, you, you really do see that link between, well, why, why can't we be more agile? Because our culture doesn't support it. Um, I've just been in um, a meeting with an organisation that wanted to, to host a, a workshop on agile culture. And it was just really interesting. I'm going to take you through some of the things that I took them through. And the sticking points were, you know, this is about how you behave at work, what you think you ought to be doing. And have you really got the bandwidth to change how you do stuff at the moment when you're so busy chasing your tail doing a load of stuff? I think one of the biggest enemies right now, culture is something that requires um, consistent behaviour over a, an elongated period of time. So achieving it's not going to be that easy. Um, I'm going to sort of put this into real world um, examples. I've got a cautionary tale from one of my clients. I've got a success story from another. Um, and then I'm going to get onto the practicalities of how we actually create culture. Um, and so we'll, we'll have a look at, at how we do this. So the first thing that I thought was really interesting, this was the um, EY um, CEO survey of 2021 and um, looking at what the CEO imperatives actually are. And I was sort of sitting there making, um, I was reading this survey for another reason. And I was sitting there um, comparing um, a board strategy that I was evaluating against this overarching global CEO survey. And I started looking, thinking, well, okay, um, there we have um, on the bottom right there, 38% are saying that one of their, their imperatives is innovation. And, and really the processes and innovating. And you think, well, you can't do that without an agile culture. Um, and then we've got 22% saying leadership is a big imperative for them. Well, you can't do that without, you know, an agile culture, uh, the, the cultural model we're gonna look at is all about leadership behaviors. And then we had culture and purpose and people and talent in the middle there. And I kept thinking, is there any one of these that doesn't get touched by the agile culture? And the answer is no. I mean, the business model top right there or the capital allocation decision making. That's all about prioritization. Agile addresses the risk that what we're developing is superseded by events outside our control. Agile mitigates the risk that we develop big 
up front. We come up with all of these ideal requirements. We go through a hefty planning phase and then we go through a very long sort of waterfall delivery and eventually we get something at the end of it. Well, Agile cuts through the risk that, that of that long funding cycle and the fact that many of the executives committing to that funding cycle will have left by the time we get to the end of it. We cut through that into short waves of delivery. So when I was thinking about all the CEO imperatives, I couldn't get away from the fact that actually, you know, there's there's some really you know useful stuff in what we're going to look at this afternoon in how it helps with some of these other imperatives. So um, I thought I'd start with a cautionary tale. Okay, I'm just going to read some notes here. I don't usually read notes, but um, this is uh, this survey. I um, brought to mind um, the fact that I'm working with what can only be described from this slide as a survivor. So the, the EY survey was looking at those organisations that during COVID and coming out of COVID uh, were building for the future. So um, those they, they carried on investing even during COVID. They accelerated their transformation programs. They were pursuing um, a growth agenda. Whereas there were survivors who instead took a very different strategy, which was to protect what they had. So they didn't want to do anything new or different. So they slowed or stopped their transformation programs and everything came down to efficiency and cost reduction. However, you know, the majority of thrivers, the vast majority of thrivers are now projecting growth in three years, whereas only 7% of the survivors are. Now, this is all to do with culture. Um, I was talking to a group of managers who wanted to affect change in their organization, but were not sure how to make it happen. They were definitely in the survivor category. And we talked about their change being wider than a, a project or program because they wanted to change how their organization addressed its workload. So they wanted to create a culture shift, essentially. Um, they wanted an agile culture able to operate in uncertainty instead of what they do at the moment, which is railing against the volatility in the market, railing against the, the volatility in customer demand, customer expectations, competitor innovations. They're very much the King Canute of their world. They're always trying to stop change and push back the waves. The reason their organization is losing the fight, I think, is because it's collectively holding itself back, waiting to do things when things become clearer, you know, when things settle down. Okay. Um, and this has been the prevailing culture all the way through COVID when they, they kept saying, because I remember what they were saying then, was that they believed that, you know, post COVID we'll enter a, a commercially more stable phase, you know, we'll know where we stand um, and then we can start growing again. And I think what's really happened here is that the, the penny has finally dropped because, the continuing supply chain uncertainties, particularly as a result of the war in Ukraine, as well as continuing COVID crisis in China. Um, coupled with the prospect of recession, the price increases, the industrial unrest, it's been a real trigger for them to go, that, that moment of stability that we were waiting for before we started growing again, it's not coming, is it? And I said, well, I think we're in for a rocky couple of years. I mean, you can't afford to wait a couple of years. So it's great that they've come to the party, but I'm, I'm cautious about their chances of survival because the creation of an agile culture it is not something that can be achieved overnight. So that's the bad news of this webinar, you know, because that's true of any organisational culture. So we know that it's going to help them, but it's going to take a long time. Now, what I thought you'd also like to hear about is a success story, but I'm afraid this does illustrate the point I've just made about you don't create an agile culture overnight, because I was recently in a review with an organisation that I've been working with for over eight years, um, and they excel at an agile approach to their to their change and transformation story. I'm sorry I can't name them, but I think quite rightly they do regard their uh, their culture and how they've achieved it is almost their competitive advantage. But as long as I don't mention who they are, I did get their permission to sort of 
talk a little bit about some of their story um, and some of the key elements of their culture. We've got to start with the fact that um, there's a very clear overarching objective, strategic direction in the organisation. Now, in their case, it's we keep growing. They're all about growth. But it does enable all the staff to whenever anything comes up and it is prevalent in the organization i see it all the time the, there's there's always this question how does this help us grow it's really simple so everybody's aligned to this very clear strategic direction and 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 everybody feels a part of it so that whole thing around leaders speaking with one voice they really do they all talk about growth of course they talk about using it well they talk about growing the organization um using their own phrases their own words um so it's not just they're reading stuff aloud um, and they keep their remarks relevant to their area of the business but there is genuinely they're all talking about the same story that's what one voice really means and it's confirmed in their staff engagement survey because they score very highly for clarity of purpose across all staff levels the next part of what they do is an evolving solution. Um, that there's this concept of uh, working iteratively, and and therefore, you know, we we keep building on what we're developing. We don't wait for perfection before we go live. And there is a real culture of everyone is involved in trying and learning. And there's an expectation that everything starts with small steps, small initial steps. Uh, if the feedback's good, then we'll carry on. If the feedback's not what we hope for, then we'll review and maybe pivot to something else. What's interesting is even the big initiatives are talked about in this way. Um, there's an expectation that even the big initiatives, it, it's almost like there's this phrase that, well, this is what we're aiming to achieve right now, dot, dot, dot. But of course, there may be tweaks because we do regular reviews of our outside marketplace. Uh, our industry and generally societal trends uh, so that we remain you know open to change another thing that they do really well in their culture is portfolio management and in fact I can break this up into two words the portfolio bit means that they they've genuinely got a sort of full catalogue or index of all of the different initiatives taking place in all their different states of completion um, and what they've really invested in doing is they've created a deck level. It sounds like Top Gun 2. Um, but below the deck, um, people can fly locally doing their own stuff, you know. So if an initiative to improve a certain part of the business comes up, you know, then they can just get on and do it. It, uh, it rises above the deck level and falls into that more centralised portfolio management if it meets the criteria around being a significant funding request perhaps, or it utilizes significant internal resource or requires the appointment of external resource or partners. Um, so it's, it's all about sort of scale. Does it have big knock-on effects that pushes it above the deck level? So they really are very clear about what's in and what's not in their portfolio. Another thing they do is that that portfolio is continually refreshed because they have a um, they have an innovation sort of competition. It's an ongoing thing. And um, the founders of the company come from uh, some of the richest universities in the world uh, and they are used to that sort of research grant type of thing. And uh, and to an extent, they, they have made people who come up with these ideas almost partners in, in the idea. They get heftily rewarded. Um, it's not just a, a token sort of 50 pound Amazon voucher that they get. They get a significant if the idea really flies and really helps the organization grow, then people are genuinely rewarded. Um, and it's not just financial reward. There is also kudos that runs throughout the company. Uh, it's a very simple process. And what I think makes it so powerful is that as you're filling in your idea, um, on screen, all of the criteria by which it will be evaluated, um, which is all connected to the growth objective, of course, because that runs like a golden thread through the organisation. Um, but as you fill that in, it, it's sort of prompting you with questions about those criteria. So you know the criteria upon which your idea will be evaluated 
so you can sort of try to answer those questions ahead of time but there's transparency everybody everybody's idea it doesn't matter who you are it's all going through the same criteria so that's their portfolio and that's their innovation competition the management part is that there's a two-step process really the first evaluation is about the overall sort of end goal what is the capability you'll be creating and is that something that we think will genuinely contribute to our growth if the answer is yes on that first step evaluation then there's a second evaluation um, where the the first step your initial step that you're going to take the first piece of value you're going to deliver is actually looked at and i think that's really interesting because i've noticed that there is very much a sort of sense of um you're trying to identify if this first step in its own right creates value for the organization um and that that assessment is based on the benefits how quickly they're likely to be realized or or is this an enabler for other things and that ties to the the, the last sort of element of, of this, which is the timing. Um, there's an expectation that those first steps will deliver within a relatively short time frame, which in my experience tends to be around the three to four months. I don't see anything getting through the door that's more than about four months um, in duration. And, and if, if that is your proposal, then they might very gently go back to you and say, well, can you sort of subdivide it? Can you break it up any more so that there's something you can pull out quite quickly to, to show that this is actually something that people want so that that timing and that early achievement the early steps goes back to validation uh, it's being validated by the feedback um it's not people sitting in a committee saying is this a good idea or not what they want is true evidence um through piloting of something and getting real feedback from real customers about whether they buy it I think this agile journey just shows you that every organization will interpret its agile culture in its own way. Um, but they do think broadly about what they do and how they do it. And I think this for me is a sort of good example of maybe what we're trying to aim for in this webinar is that we're trying to put those building blocks in place about what an agile culture would actually involve. And I think that brings me to another point, which is um, a number of organizations who aren't that agile, but think that they are. <laughs> um, it's because what they're doing is that they're doing the sort of almost development level agility, very methodology driven. Um, so they're using all of the sort of techniques, they're using all of the ceremonies. So they're doing daily scrums, they're doing um, uh, reviews, regular reviews, they're doing sprints and backlogs. But one of the problems that comes across is is that they get caught up in sort of delivering on a on almost like a production line of iteration after iteration unstoppingly and so they're adding more and more features and functionality into into the way work is done they're adding more and more tangible changes to the way stuff is done um and but they're losing sight of that pragmatic what does this do for us so I see a lot of developmental agility um, to fix that because the, the problems do become apparent. Then you see organizations go into the next level, which is that they set up, um, often they set up sort of product owners, product managers, and instead of projects, they tend to go down the product route. Um, but it, it's very much more about, well, what's the overall capability? Is the product owner speaking on behalf of the customer? So there's more customer collaboration and representation um, and that's how they're trying to fix things. But the bit we're talking about today is the hardest bit of all. It's that highest level of real organizational culture, which is that running through the organization, this is how we do things, that they, people are actually thinking, yeah, but how do we behave in, a, in an agile way? Now, I've shown this slide, this next slide before on a previous webinar, but I, I'm going to do it now because I think it just gives us two minutes of well, what does she mean by organisational agility? Uh, and the answer is it's, it's these agile concepts that everything you do is, is driven by business need, that therefore we're very good at, at knowing 
like the growth objective in the, the success story um, that we're very clear what our ambitions are and, and we use that to prioritise. Um, we deliver on time, we deliver in an iterative way and we deliver an on evolving solution and, and we collaborate the organised sort of sharing of information and activities internally and externally. We're very good at partnering. We're very good at bringing people in. So that collaboration runs through. And I think this leads us to a number of leadership sort of skill sets that I want to seed in your mind because we're gonna have a look at the recipe for corporate culture in a moment and you'll see where all this fits in. But if you wanna create that agile culture, then there has to be something around, you know, that clear, strategic objective you have to imagine what the future will be how do you want people working what do you want them doing and you tie everything that they do to that clear articulation of the future but it flexes because you know that the world around you changes and you're a product of the world around you so you have leaders who are very very good at setting that big agenda of where we are heading but it's not set in stone it is flexible that's the evolving solution that they're going for. And I think that that enables people to um, see themselves in that ambition and they feel a part of that. And, and the culture is that people are contributing to all to the same goal. So they're all on the same side. And that evolving solution is very much driven um, by, you know, on the business need side that that people are willing to take active decisions about well what is a they prioritize stuff what's a part of um that bigger future and if it's not then we won't do it I, i've just spent the afternoon talking about this and and the courage required for that kind of leadership where you take active um decisions uh, you don't just sit on the sidelines asking for more information you are actually willing to get in there and take the decision. Um, there is, I think, as part of an agile culture, this on-time delivery, what sits underneath that is a willingness to go, I know it's not perfect, but let's get it into operational use and we can add more to it later. So there's a big tie there with an iterative approach, but you've got to be willing to, to abandon perfectionism um we've just i've just been in a meeting where we talked about operational excellence being one of their pillars of success and i went really excellence that means that you are constantly late and you're constantly um procrastinating because it's not quite perfect and that's what's causing you a massive problem and we ended up talking about reframing it as operational innovation because if you're constantly innovating you're constantly improving that is something aspirational but it, it enables you to be agile because it, it does take you down that iterative approach and it does deliver you an evolving solution. See, I've been talking for about 20 minutes about all these different aspects of agile. And you see, the point is that in for you to build an agile culture where you're working, you have to start talking to everybody about what they think is involved in an agile culture. I'm very willing for you to use these slides that Mark's going to circulate, you know, any of this that might be helpful to you to get the conversation going. I mean, I'm putting suggestions on here about what collaboration looks like, for example, or what um, an iterative approach looks like in terms of sort of what you have to do culturally, what has to become the cultural norm. But you will have to have these conversations and surface all of this and debate it and come to some kind of agreement. Because what we're talking about here is we we really are talking about beliefs and values, and that gives us the recipe for organizational culture. Four beliefs are the building blocks of any culture, the attitudes, the, the priorities, the things that we think we should be doing that's important. And, and what they are hidden. We, we do not discuss them on a day to day basis, but they are just just in there. Just there's something that's so core to how the organization does things that it, it affects, you know, behaviors, 
you see after all you've got to have an agreement about what you're what's important to you because that should drive your behaviors in any culture i mean we're talking about building an agile culture but this is a recipe for any building of any organizational culture and if you're wondering where it's come from it's it's not me um i would say professor edgar shine and uh, professors von trompenars and hampton turner have something to say about this um there's a lot of their work in this um but it's basically those values, those beliefs that you think these are the things that, that, are, that are right for us, then that should lead to how people do things around here. And then what happens is that the, the last two parts of the recipe are on a par with each other in that there is the structural stuff about those behaviours get baked into your standards or your policies or your procedures they get baked into people's job descriptions and their kpis and at the same time also on the visible the right hand side is much more visible is it's about how culture is genuinely experienced by people so people will see people behaving in a particular way that's the role that they can follow their lead the role modeling but they'll also talk about seeing people behave in a particular way and that will sort of create the cult of whatever is in your culture, if you like. Give you an example, um, working in financial services, um, more traditional banks, you know, like in, in the UK, we, you know, we, we have our checking accounts like NatWest, for example, it might be HSBC. But we've also got um, some challenger banks like Wise and Starling. Uh, very much digital natives but it's not how they do things I'm interested in it's if you scrape the surface and I've had the privilege of being able to do this in a number of, of challenger banks but also a number of more traditional organizations and what you get is that in the traditional organizations the core beliefs that drive everything they do is a protectionism of the customer because the core belief is our customers are money amateurs. We have to do everything for them. We will have to be in control because they don't know enough. They can't be trusted, even though it's their money. Whereas the challenger banks have a completely different core belief around the, the business and commercial savviness of their customers. The fact that their customers are very demanding of high levels of service and that there's almost a race to keep satisfying the customer. It's a completely different core belief and leads to completely different behaviors. So what I see in the behaviors of the more traditional banks is an awful lot of sort of governance levels and sort of sitting on their hands while they consider decisions at committee after committee. Whereas what I see is um, algorithms written by these other banks based on certain values that they all agree on and there's a speed and there's a momentum to getting things done that's absent in the other banks so i i can see how core beliefs drive the behaviors that people do if you're going to create your culture then you have to dig into well what are our core beliefs then what are the core beliefs for an agile way of working and what are the core beliefs um and what are the leadership behaviors that support that so that's what I thought I'd have a look at now. But before I move on, I'm going to just turn to Mark and make sure that there aren't any questions that I haven't answered or any observations that anybody shared um, that uh, would like to be aired. So there's over 100 of you on the call. So I just want to make sure I'm tapping in with you guys. Yeah, thanks, Mel. Good, uh, good, uh, good point to start. There's one one not particularly late to raise. So it says, could Melanie please identify what type of projects this agile approach does not apply to? Um, and then he's highlighted a couple of examples which are UK specific. So um, Thames Tideway, which I think is a flood defence system on the River Thames and HS2 and Crossrail, which are big network, uh, rail projects. Mm -hmm. Well, again, you see those projects, um, got to be careful here with a, an agile change approach. Um, what we're talking about is uh, we have tangible change which creates something like a big engineering project might create something that didn't exist before and then you have the actual implementation and adoption of that piece now i'm going to give you an example of how um even if uh waterfall projects because i'm certainly not going to get in caught in the argument that says everything must be agile because i think that's so naive um there will always be waterfall or traditional managed projects 
where they start with all the requirements up front and they deliver you a complete solution after a certain period of time. And in some cases, in particularly in engineering construction, sometimes that makes the absolute most sense. And I'm not going to try and say that that's wrong because I, I, I don't think that helps any of us because I think it's sort of just creating a sort of naivety um, around, oh, Agile has to be used for everything. Just shutting the window as my dogs decided to start barking like crazy. Um, but if there is that waterfall agile um, waterfall project, I still think that you can use agile to, if you like, think about the waterfall project that you've just described there, Mark, as building the plane. And you can use a more agile approach for building the runway. So all the changes in people's ways of working. So the Thames Tideway, which is a flood defense system. Um, that had to change an awful lot of people, a, a lot of people's day-to-day um, uh, -day jobs based on a new flood defence system. They had to work in a different way. You can start edging them towards those new ways of working and some of the new cultural norms and values that they have to adopt without all of the tangible change being in place before that moment. So I think you can do waves of behavioural and cultural change that are about building the runway for using the tangible change that may in its own right be created in a more waterfall appro approach. Hopefully that satisfies the, uh, the questioner. Anything else, Mark, before I move on? Uh, it's just one that's literally just come in, so I'm just trying to get my head around it. Um, do, 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 do. Yeah, just some of the comments in, if an organisation has to accommodate all these, all different perspectives and experiences, it will be difficult. Um, how do you find a middle ground to be an effective organisation and take into consideration various recommendations for change? I think it all comes back to the core beliefs, uh, which is the underpinning. Um, what do we value around here? What do we do around here? Let me let me take you forward to that and let's let's see how we get on with that then. So how do we create core beliefs? The first thing is we have to talk about what on earth we're talking about. What do we mean? Um, and so we're talking about the assumptions that we don't even know that we're making sometimes, the priorities, the what are things we agree with, the desirable outcomes, the things we aspire to be, the things we value, um, the questions we ask ourselves to assess if we're doing things right. Now, I never put these slides together without giving a, a great deal of thought to what I'm saying. And this slide pr prompted me to, to really think about um, the, the core beliefs that are operating in my organisation. Um, and it was really interesting that we're going through a, an issue with the software developer at the moment um, and terminating a contract. And it was really interesting to see that what are, how do we behave? What do we think are, what's important? Not just when things are going well, but when things are going badly. And actually, there was that that core belief that runs through all of us, which is a genuine, genuine belief that it, it impacts how we do things, which is, oh, do not get into the aggressive blame game and pointing fingers. Things haven't worked out. Well, OK, it's a shame. The software company hasn't delivered. That's caused a lot of problems for a lot of people. But oh, let's not get into sort of um, really getting into the blame game because we don't we don't subscribe to that because those people worked hard. It hasn't worked out. They didn't get out of bed every morning going, how can we screw this other company over? So that wasn't what was happening. So we are much more of a company that one of our core values is when we hit problems, we put our energy not into looking backwards and blaming others, but we put our energy into, well, how can we move forward from this point forward? How can we solve the problems that the, the difficulties caused us rather than railing against the difficulty and going, woe is me. Oh, it's so unfair. Life's unfair. And, and we ended up talking about this in the office and sort of saying, well, yeah, I think it's probably because we all take the view that life is incredibly unfair. Um, so, uh, so there's no point sort of moaning about it. It's what you do and what you get on and do. Uh, and that for me was just an example of a, a core belief that runs through everybody um, in the group that I'm working with. Um, but I, I can see that because I've sort of stepped back and had a really good think about it. <laughs> it's not always immediately obvious. Um, here are some that uh, come from a very agile place. 
Um, so just taking this from organizations that have really started to, I, I would say in my experience, they are certainly more agile than they are more traditional. And so what they're saying there is that we value what you get done. We value the difference that you make. What we don't do in our organization is look over your shoulder and see how many hours have you done this week. We, and we, we don't, we don't emphasize busyness and activity. We're interested in what difference have you made? That's what's important to us. And I think that's really important for um, uh, the evolving solution, um, for prioritizing against business need, all those sorts of things. Um, this was a really interesting conversation with the president of a, a, a big manufacturing company. Um, we had we are different nationalities so it took us a while we circled around the conversation but eventually we got the right translations to understand that as he said i have an answer it may not be the answer my answer is only one perspective and my job is to facilitate the discussion so that we end up with a range of alternative answers and then we can select the best one and I thought, what a lovely way of describing a non, it's almost like the, the opposite of that hierarchical governance that we see where the person at the top of the tree is apparently the one who has all the answers. I love the fact you said, I have an answer, not necessarily the answer. And my job is to go and find other answers and then find out what's the best one. I thought, oh, there's so much in there about he sees that he is personally responsible for finding an answer. So he is part of the solution, um, but he's also, he sees his job as to facilitate the answers from others. So he is about being genuinely collaborative. There was so much you could unpack from what he was saying, that they were real beliefs of his about how he saw his role and how he wanted every leader in his organization to operate. Um, and that comes down, I think, to empowerment and, and people feeling that genuinely, it's, again, it's that shared goal. And the success story I shared was that everybody signs up to the fact that, yeah, um, our job is to grow the organization, you know, um, and our, they always question, does this help us grow? You know, so everyone's a part of the success. Now, it goes back to that apocryphal story, doesn't it? When JFK was visiting um, what was then called Cape Can Canaveral and whether or not it was, uh, you know, he meets somebody who's um, uh, washing the floor. What are you doing? I'm helping to put a man on the moon. Very apocryphal sort of story. And then lastly, this was about being... <sighs> you could argue there's fail fast in here but it's a value which is about well look we we go looking for what's wrong we we ask could we do this better we we celebrate finding problems before they they become problems um because we see them as learning opportunities we we don't shy away from what might be wrong have a think about these have a think just take a moment and possibly share some in the chat is there a core belief that you think this is the value that I operate every day when I'm working? This is this is quite important to me. What's what's your value? What's your core belief about how things should be done? So I'm just going to leave you for a moment to have a little think, because I think it'd be nice for, for us to make this much more of a collaborative exercise. And with so many of you on the call, I'm sure some of you have got some ideas about what you think that might be. While we're waiting for those, Mel, we'll let's just touch on this uh, other question. Um, I don't. It's, it's probably a tough one to answer here, but I can I can at least offer one thing myself. So, but the the question is, have you got any information as to the degree of adoption of agile pr practices in the UK, Europe, or in Asia? Um, now, for me, I know there's a there's a couple of reports out there. There's one that I've seen before. I think it's from a company called Version One State of Agile Report. Yeah, the fifteenth. Um, it's, it's actually in its fifteenth year, Mark. Um, mm. It's called it, um, it's called the State of Agile, and I like that one. But I also like um, the J Curve one um, that's been done by a, a company called Truthsayers, who are base their questions on good neuroscientific principles. So I'm a big fan of Truthsayers' work, um, and I would highly recommend that one. And I'll put the links, Mark. I'll put the links into um, uh, when you share out the recording perfect 
Good. So a few few contributions coming through now. So honesty, uh, trust uh, in a timely manner, meeting deadlines, mm -hmm. uh, adapting to change. Uh, daily mantra is progress, not perfection. I like that one. Oh, I love that. You ever put that in? Really, really good. Yeah, loving that. Yeah, because that was the same as this afternoon. We were talking about pragmatism over perfectionism. It's the same sort of thing. It's all to do with that get stuff done, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, really well done. Thank you for contributing. So if I just go back for a moment, we were looking at this recipe for how do you build organizational culture? And you have to think, what are those underlying values, those underlying assumptions or core beliefs that actually drive a lot of your decision making and a lot of your behaviors? And then from that, we can start to think about, well, what does good behavior look like? As we said, culture is how we do stuff around here. Well, let's have a look, therefore, at how we should be doing stuff around here. So how we create these behaviors, again, unpack the word, get people discussing what they think it is. I mean, behaviors are often, they are actions, things we do. Um, and they could be routines and habits where, you know, the action is so automatic, we can't even remember why we do it. Um, there might be some things that we do in a very deliberate and planned way. Um, there might be just emotional reactions to events, but how do we behave, you know? And what we can do here is, again, get people talking about um, what would be a good behavior. And, I'm looking here at agile leadership behaviors. So things that I've I've talked about, like mobilizing everybody towards the same goal, talking about what that goal means in your area of the business um, and sharing. I've got an organization at the moment. What they've done is a cascade. They've got their strategic objective, which actually is about innovation. They want to be an um, Apple about 10 years ago, I think if you asked anybody who worked at Apple about 10 years ago, they would have said, I work for the most innovative company in the world. Um, this organization wants to, to achieve something similar culturally. They want their culture to be a culture of innovation and, and, and constant new ideas. Um, so they are, they're mobilizing everybody towards that. But what's really interesting is the senior leadership team who are really they're really quite impressive group, have gone away and almost written their own vision of what that innovation means to them. And then they have they have walked it through with each other. Um, uh, they, they've made some tweaks along the way and they've decided um, that they are going to have this conversation every year going forward. They talked about doing it more frequently and they decided, no, it's a it's an anchor point for everybody to sort of organize themselves around. So we even if we do enhance it, we're, we're going to do it on an annual basis and no more frequently than that. But what I've noticed is that when they are mobilizing everybody towards the innovation sort of goal, they're all, they, they then explain it relevant to their division, but they're also able to share what the other divisions of the organization are being told as well. So they are sort of trying to get sort of join the dots, which I think is really interesting. Um, I've got so many horror stories. It staggers me. Um, and these are big name brands of announcing a big new initiative. Yeah. All oh, right. This is where we're all going to put our energy towards. And then months later, there's been no communication about it at all. It's like we have the town hall meeting. The CEO gets out there and says everything. Uh, there might be an online sort of yammer chat for an hour after the town hall meeting. It's all go, go, go. And then nothing comes out again. And I think the thing is that if you want an agile culture, remember, we're always iterating. We, we're doing things in an incremental way. So you have to keep talking. You have to highlight what's been going on and how it all fits together. So if you want agile behaviors, then you, you have to keep talking in an agile way. So you have to talk about the, the, the next iteration, the next version up and what's happening. 
But I think I was on LinkedIn last night talking to somebody about um, what was the one sort of um, behaviour that if I had to pick out um, that I thought made the greatest difference um, towards being a sort of agile organisation, it absolutely was that ability to cut through everything and prioritise and say, these are the three core things we should be doing. These other 17 will have to wait. And that takes an awful lot of courage because when you say yes to three things, you are saying no to the 17 others. You've got that awful voice of doubt in your heads, which makes you think, no, what if I'm wrong? And that is what's stopping our leaders across every industry and organization from prioritizing. If there's a fear factor and it's really worrying, but I think the one that cuts across that is the willing to stop things and say this, you know, we're spreading people so thin. Agile is all about getting stuff done. Agile is all about having achievements. It's about early and frequent return on investment. You don't get that if you're spreading people across 20 initiatives in a working week, which means what? The most that they can probably give to it is a couple of hours. If you cut it down to three things, they can spend a couple of days on each of those three things and get stuff done really move things forward so if you want to be agile there's prioritization and then there is a willingness to stop things and then finally we have to back it all up and the way we have to back it up is we have to be intentional about what we acknowledge what we praise what we celebrate what we congratulate because if we're not careful we and somebody i know was talking to me about this recently about how she had definitely fall into this trap is that she wanted an, a more agile approach which is that she wanted people to sort of get stuff done she didn't care how they did it she was empowering them to sort out how they were going to work what techniques they were going to use even which days they worked on it but it was agreed what they were going to deliver but she fell into the trap she said of celebrating and thanking people for working hard and she said, oh, I'm an idiot. I'm, I'm celebrating. I'm acknowledging that they've they've been doing a lot. But what I haven't been doing is I haven't been stopping that and just concentrating my thanks on. That they've actually delivered something, that something's gone into operational use, something's now up and running and therefore something is starting to make a difference. She said, I. I, I've got to catch myself in the moment, she said. I'm a people pleaser, so I want to do this. But she said, I've got to catch myself and ask myself, if I congratulate people for this activity, this behaviour, then they will repeat it. Because the thing that we know is that when we get praise, it creates a lovely dopamine hit in the brain. And we think, well, how did we get that praise? Oh, we did that last time. Oh, I'm going to do some more of that and get even more praise. So leaders have to be really careful about what it is they praise, because that's what you get repeated. So I think these behaviours off the back of whatever your core beliefs are, you have to then work out what is it that we do that everybody notices that we do. Remember, this is when you do something, people will tell stories and hold it up as examples. So you have to be very intentional about your behavior. So when it comes to creating an agile culture, this is the simple recipe you need to follow. There's a lot of talking needed. There's a lot of finding common ground. There's a lot of deciding what of the core beliefs and what of the behaviours will make the most difference that will make your organisation agile. And it's going to be a different answer for every organisation. But once you have that understanding, don't forget to bake it in to your structural how you do stuff there might be a staff handbook there might be uh, role descriptions um, there could be um, sort of a quality management system with all your procedures and processes whatever it is bake in how you do stuff it's not exciting but it means that you don't fall back to your old ways of doing things 
because culture is one of those things to build it it requires a lot of time and repetition over time saying the same things illustrating the same examples telling the same stories over and over until it becomes the accepted norm around where you are so for me that's the recipe for an agile culture i'm sure mark's got a few more comments or observations but put anything you want in the chat anything you agreed with anything you disagreed with or anything you want clarification on i'm here to answer your questions yeah thanks Mel. great stuff as ever um it's, it's quite quiet on the questions front actually but uh well we're waiting for a few to come in i mean you you must have seen some horror stories with the organizations you work with what's the, what's the one that stands out for you culture well, obviously i'm not looking for names no but i i would say that there is one theme around all organizations at the moment and it is this that it's that um failure to prioritize and particularly to stop things means that people are overwhelmed by their workloads um, they are trying to help each other out. So I had a meeting today where 10 people should have turned up and only five did. One person sent in her, ob her observations and comments about the subject, um, but as she wasn't gonna be in the discussion, those were no use whatsoever. She might, so, so what? You took 10 minutes to write something down. Um, there's no help to anybody. People are so busy at the moment, and this is in every organization that we're starting to see that we're, we're not delivering, uh, we're not achieving. We are talking a lot about achieving in meeting after meeting, but we've got so many Zoom calls in our diary that we've got no actual time for getting stuff done. I'm sure I'm not the only one that looks at Friday, for example, now as a day when I'm least likely to be in meetings. So there's a greater chance I will actually get to write some stuff and create some stuff. Or I actually have to get up at the crack of dawn or I have to stay late in the evening to actually, when everybody else has gone home, get stuff done. And I think, Mark, to be honest, that is the prevalent problem across loads of organisations. If anybody, put your hand up if anybody, um, or a smiley face or whatever you're allowed to do in this particular platform, um, if you think that that is something that resonates with you. You're feeling a, that there's you're spread too thin and nobody's prioritising around you? Yeah, I, I don't think there is a, anything that can be done on here to... Oh, the other than the, the comments, chat. other than the comments, but there's, uh, there's yeah, there's some smiley faces agreements coming through on the questions and yes, yeah. so... It's, it's getting serious, actually. It's really getting serious because it's holding back all of our progress, and and we we end up talking about why I haven't done something. I, I get called into a meeting to why I haven't done something. Why I haven't done it? Because I'm in a meeting telling you I haven't done it because I haven't had the time to do it. Um, yeah. yeah, we're gonna have to. Yeah, we have to prioritise. Yeah. The great point from Angela here. The culture seems to be you aren't working hard enough unless you were overly busy. So true. Well, we're coming up to uh, five two, so I'm happy to, to finish uh, unless there are any other points that anybody wants to raise. But I hope you take this recipe forward and it gives you something to think about when you're starting to establish your agile culture, because Mark's absolutely right. There are lots of surveys that will tell you that the biggest reason that organisations are not more agile is because that wider cultural acceptance of, well, agile and all that goes with agile the bigger concepts isn't baked into our culture so that's what we've got to sort out yeah great point to finish on now um should we skip forward to uh got further info slide haven't we i will i'll put the other slides on that was a very gentle hint from mark to say <laughs> get your slides in order so there we go <laughs> if you need me for anything guys just get hold of me in linkedin or email me yeah, and funnily enough, actually, I've actually put a link on the further info side because I thought it might come up today. So um, the state, well, actually, state of agile culture that Melanie was talking about uh, with truth sayers, um, that's available through the Agile Business Consortium's website, which is there. So take a look at the resources section, and you'll find oh, well, some details excellent. there. Yeah, I do recommend that. I do recommend that highly. I've been speaking to the uh, CEO of Truth Sayers, and um, he's a person who knows what he's doing. So I, I do recommend having a look at that. Yeah, 
yeah and um yeah being a being a certification body it'd be remiss of me not to say something about our agile certification so if you're in the change management project management program management space uh there's a sort of uh, preview of the various certifications we offer there so do take a look at those on the on the website um but that's it so thank you everybody for attending thank you mel as ever for your contributions and content brilliant stuff as ever do let mark and i know if there's another subject you would like us to tackle because um come after the summer we're happy to do something so if there's something you want to talk about let us know yeah we yeah, have great point and um yeah just a reminder if uh, if you joined a little late as well we are rec we have recorded the session and um i'll be getting that online tomorrow and we'll get the follow-up email out tomorrow so look out for that we'll we'll include the slides there too so that's it. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your week and the weekend ahead. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.